So today I'm talking about uh, advances in metagenomic approaches to detect foodborne pathogens or metagenomic approaches to uh, get to know more about the ecology of foodborne pathogens. And so this is the overview of my talk. I will have a short introduction or uh, about metagenomic approaches. So different types of microbiome sequences and while discussing those things, I will also stress that advances that have been made in microbiome sequencing approaches over the last couple of years. Um, if we're talking about metagenomic approaches, we have to think of a, a trifecta. So it's a trifecta of the data we collect, sequencing technology, and how we analyze the data. So our, my next topic will be about the introduction of long read sequencing. I think in the last couple of years in, in microbiome uh, applications. And last but not least, I'm going to discuss some real life data uh, to show how we can leverage actually the microbiome for pathogen detection. So if we're talking about microbiome sequencing, there are two main um, uh, ways of sequencing microbiomes. One of them is amplicon sequencing. So that means that we use a highly conserved yet variable part of the genome and um, about 300 to 500 base pair, dependent on the, the sequencing technology. Uh, um, Technology that we use to sequence of all or the preferred part of the organisms that we're interested in of a, a sample. And traditionally, those are our RNA genes. So 16S for archaea and bacteria, but one thing to keep in mind is that um, chloroplast also has sequence 16S and 18S and ITS uh, for eukaryotes. So a quick overview, um, the wet lab part of the sequencing is basically doing a PCR and preparing the PCR in a, a library prep and sequencing it on your um, uh, sequencing system of choice. Um, a bioinformatics step where we do OTU classification. So this is a, a, a part of, of um, microbiome research where we have seen a, a lot of advances over the last couple of years, which consists of data filtering, filtering out cross contaminants, false injects, pairing, et cetera. And um, one of the things is if you do this kind of sequencing, so um, amplicon based um, sequencing is to put in a lot of controls. So negative controls and positive controls. So one of the advantages of amplicon sequencing is that you can start with small amounts of starting material, uh, which is especially if you talk about environmental sampling, for instance, in, in, in food processing plants, very important. Um, based on the pr primers that you use, only the organisms of choice, so only bacteria, um, uh, will be sequenced and it's highly efficient. So because you only look at one gene, a, a limited number of uh, reads is enough for a microbiome uh, survey, which translates to if you multiplex 96 samples on an Illumina MySeq run to some, um, dependent on how, uh, what you pay for your consumables, you can, can uh, push the price down to less than 40 dollars a sample. The disadvantages of using amplicon sequencing is, is that um, all the, the ways of um, most uh, bioinformatics uh, uh, applications for amplicon sequencing uh, workflows uh, rely on database searches. So you have to have a really good database with representatives of the organisms you um, expect in your database to classify your organisms. Uh, the reliance again on primers makes, is, it makes it also possible that you are missing organisms. 
that are important um, for your for further analysis because your primers didn't didn't catch that diversity. And one of the things that I I found um, is a disadvantage of RNA amplicon sequence is that it also am amplifies a case of 16 as organelles of eukaryotes. So if you want to um, look for the microbiome of a living plant for endosymbionts, most of your reads will go to 16S of the, 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 the chloroplast of a plant. So the other big, big way of, of sequencing microbiomes is shotgun microbiomics. So in that case, you, all DNA in sample is sequenced without any enrichment or PCR amplification. So you treat the sample as if it was one large organism with a very big genome, of course. The genome consists of multiple genomes of, of micro microorganisms. So there are two main approaches for analysis. You can do read classification. So that in that case, the bioinformatics uh, workflow predicts per read, try to match it to what organism it belongs. Uh, and that's, again, very database dependent. And then there is the de novo assembly and binning approach. And that's a very interesting approach. And here we have a cartoon. Uh, basically, what it does is here we have our original microbiomes. And these circles are individual genomes. We sequence them. And basically, we, we, we don't sequence um, genomes in long reads. Usually, we sequence them in little puzzle pieces of, of 300 base pairs, 250 base pairs, if we use different um, Sequencing technologies, we can have it up to like 10,000 base pairs, but we never sequence those genomes entirely. What we do then, we sequence them, we assemble those genomes and try to get reassemble those pieces of genomes in longer pieces. And then we try to classify those pieces based on abundance, so statistics and on sequence characteristics. So in this case, this sample is metabet, and we use uh, tetranucleotides, so four base pair word frequencies to make individual bin, bin, uh, bins. And then we make those bins and try to reconstruct the original genomes again. So this is a very interesting applica uh, application. So what we get in the end, from this workflow are max, so metagenome assembled uh, mm -hmm. genomes. So the advantages of shotgun metagenomics is that we don't have any reliance on primers, everything is sequenced. So we don't have to worry that our primers didn't, didn't catch like um, all of our diversity. And whole genomes are sequenced. So it makes it possible to study gene abundance, the presence of gene families of interest. So you can predict potentially um, uh, virulence genes or antimicrobial resistance genes uh, in your, your microbial population. And the ability to study the uncultured, the microbial dark matter. So it's better at that than amplicon based approaches. And I always like to show this picture. This is like a tree of life and all those red dots here, including this large new candidate phylum, are new organisms that have been discovered with that assembly based approach. So the disadvantages is, again, it's almost like what, what's an advantage is also a disadvantage because we don't rely on primers, everything is sequenced. So if we go to a meat processing plant and, and um, we, we, we sequence our DNA, 99% of our, our DNA or of the sequence reads may go to actual um, uh, animals that are processed in that plant. So in this case, um, chicken or, or turkey. And because we, we need a lot of, like uh, we don't look at a single gene, but 
called genomes, it's also expensive. So to get enough coverage for certain communities, especially complex communities, and then a higher sequencing run is sometimes necessary. So instead of that $40 that we spent per, per sample for 16S sequencing, if you have a super complex um, uh, microbiome, uh, you may may spend like a thousand to two thousand dollars per per um, uh, sample. So one of the advantage that that have um, uh, so there there are a lot of different um, variants of these two um, uh, ways of of sequencing microbiomes, getting a picture of what's in the microbiome, and one of the advances I think. In respect of, with respect to to foodborne pathogens, that has been um, pursued in by the Deng Lab at the Center for Food Safety at UTA, and by the FDA is the introduction of quasi metagenomics. So one thing to keep in mind with foodborne pathogens, um, if things didn't get out of hand, um, is th that they usually make up a very minor component of a microbiome. So if you want to do shotgun metagenomics, you needed a lot of sequence capacity, even to find those, those um, foodborne pathogens. So they can easily go undetected in traditional microbiome analysis. So quasi-metagenomics uses a number of amplification and selective steps to uh, sequence organisms of interest. So here's a, an overview. And this was a paper that was published in 2018 by by Chen Deng's group. Uh, in this case, they took three different um, uh, products: black pepper, lettuce, and chicken breast. And what they did was first they uh, put them through a, a, a traditional enrichment. In this case, they looked at Salmonella enterica. So Salmonella enterica uh, enrichment. Then instead of going through the whole enrichment, they could stop the enrichment at a very, um, after a sh very short time, like 12 or 24 hours. And then they enriched the uh, final sample with immunomagnetic beads that were specific for Enterobacteriaceae. And to top it off, they created more DNA after the, the enrichment the immunomagnetic um, uh, beads with uh, a, a, a whole genome amplification step. So with the 529 uh, uh, DNA polymerase, um, phage polymerase. So what you can do then, you can do real-time PCR to go straight for your organism of interest. But you can also sequence your um, organism with your sequence platform of choice. And the interesting thing here is that they spiked the, the, the um, samples with, with known strains and they were able to recover like the entire genome at an accurate enough level to do strain identification and do the kind of, of, of um, uh, um, strain level um, uh, subtyping that, that was discussed in the previous talk. So the other advantage if we talk about um, uh, sequencing is the introduction of long read sequencing technologies into metagenomics. So a lot of what we do as bioinformaticians, and I specifically say we because I consider myself a bioinformatician, a lot of uncertainty in microbiome data sets has to do with the fact that we use short reads. So Illumina reads are typically like between 150 and 300 base pairs these days. They're, they're really accurate, but they're very short. So all our approaches, we, we're dealing with, with small pieces of genome and they just um, contain less taxonomic information. So we have to do a lot of, of um, bioinformatics tricks to, uh, to, to name them. 
So replacing or including reads with long read technologies can greatly improve the accuracy of some of those microbiome analysis. Like I showed you the MAC uh, workflow. So the assembly assemblies are better, so we can better uh, recover whole genomes from, from microbiomes. But we also have more data to, to um, make more accurate predictions of what is in our microbiome. Biomes. So the two, two different um, analysis workflows just get better. Uh, the only problem is that long read technologies as they are now, and again, that advances almost every day, is that they have a higher sequencing error rate as compared to, for example, luminary reads. So here are, is an example of, of one of the early players of, of uh, uh, long read technology, so Pacific Biosciences with their smart single molecule real time sequencing. So it's a long read platform, and one of the things to uh, keep in mind is that it has a very large footprint. Even their smaller sequences have a large footprint, and you need a lot of specialized equipment for library preps. So Kind of the new kit of the, on the block, at least a couple of years ago, was Oxford Nanopore, and they produced these really small sequencing uh, devices that can plug into a laptop and do your sequencing in-house. And here we have the MinION, and here we have, I still haven't seen it in real life, the Smitchen that they, they developed as a, a sequencing device that you could plug into your, your iPhone. And this is an interesting read, long read technology. So uh, there are competitions of users to get the longest reads. So usually the long reads are between 100,000 uh, base pairs. But recently I've, I've heard people that could get long reads that were um, close to half a E. coli genome. And the, the cool thing about this data, this, this platform, is that it's fast. So you can do a sequencing run in a day. And even after a couple of hours, you can start analyzing the data. So while well, the sequencing run is, is in progress. So if you want to look for a specific organism, you can start to uh, analyze your, your, your data while it comes off the machine. The problem is, is that it has a hyper read error rate. So um, as a bioinformatician, you have to deal with that. And uh, the applications as they are now, largely overlap with PEC bio, but with a much lower cost in upfront investment. And just as a um, something to notice is that this is currently the sequencer of, of choice in a lot of um, uh, uh, source CoV2 uh, uh, sequencing efforts. So then I come to my last part of the talk. So we talked about um, looking for for foodborne pathogens in meta you know, or microbiome data sets. We looked at how to amplify our um, uh, pathogens of choice in a data set, but can we just use the microbiome data as they are with much, without much uh, manipulation to uh, predict the occurrence of, of pathogens? Again, to keep in mind is that you don't find a lot of reads in your, your data sets of, of foodborne pathogens. If we have those microbiomes data, can we find higher abundance microbial taxa, families, genera, species that can accurate, are accurate predictors of the occurrence of foodborne pathogens. So can we find novel indicator species with our microbiome data? Uh, can we look at the whole community and associate like certain community profiles um, uh, with the occurrence of foodborne pathogens? And I'm not going into detail on that, that into that question, but that's certainly something we can do, and we can even do it with 16S data. So here I have an example of uh, 
a group of Penn State, uh, of the Kofetch lab, and they looked at, at the uh, microbiome of uh, three apple, uh, three apple, and other three fruit packaging facilities to look for, um, and they used amplicon-based methods, 16S for bacterial organisms and fungal ITS communities, uh, to see if there was a relation to the presence of Listeria monocytogenes. And they did find that the microbiota in this facility, and specifically in the wet processing um, area, was uh, associated with Listeria monocytogenes. And the highest Listeria monocytogenes occurrence was uniquely, um, those microbiomes were uniquely predominated by bacterial, the bacterial family of the Pseudomonas daisy and the fun fungal family of the Depodesaceae. Uh, so the interesting thing here is that um, there's this initial, and that's where bioinformatics comes in. Right now we have information at the family level that we can use uh, a novel taxonomy, so more precision in our taxonomic uh, placement and uh, new, newer um, uh, bioinformatics pipelines to go even uh, deeper into those sequencing data to home in on potential species level associations, if possible, that uh, can tell us more about those communities. So I used that too, so I reanalyzed their data set. And it's a method to infer the exact sequence of templates of the applicants in an applicant method. And it gives us applicant sequence variants. So we can use we reconstruct the, the actual um, uh, uh, templates that gave us the PCR uh, product. Um, next, I analyzed it with DSEC2, and that's a, a, a statistical method which tells us which of those sequence variants are significantly over or underrepresented in, in specific groups. So I compared uh, samples that were Listeria monocytogenes positive versus those that are Listeria monocytogenes negative. And next, I looked for data phylogenetic analysis of those, those um, partial 16S sequence to figure out if what the diversity, how, what, um, how far we could go uh, to figure out what the species or sub, sub populations were that, that uh, contributed to those uh, listeria monocytogenes associated taxa. So here we have the output of these uh, DSEC analysis. It's a, a kind of a difficult picture, but all these dots are individual taxa that are significantly associated with the positive occurrence of listeria or negative occurrence of, of Listeria monocytogenes. And so one of the interesting things here is that the genus that's most mostly associated with um, uh, Listeria here, positively, but also negatively associated with Listeria, is a subgroup of Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas E. And you can see here that apparently not all Pseudomonas E strains are created equal because some of them are positively associated. So this is phylogenetic tree of pseudomonas here, and some of them are negatively associated, and some of them are more abundant with, uh, when you compare them between environments with Listeria monocytogenes than others. So one of the things here is to, that is of note is the Pseudomonas fragae clade, so a cold tolerant pseudomonas that's very good in bioform formation, which seems to be um, highly associated with um, Listeria monocytogenes. So those pseudomonas fragae, if we look at, um, could be like an indicator species that tells us more about harbored sites, potential harbored sites of Listeria monocytogenes. Um, without having to, to search for Listeria monocytogenes. So uh, this is just an example of, of how bioinformatics uh, and improved bioinformatics method, methods um, 
that are improving over the years are contributing to to our understanding of, of foodborne pathogens and their role in relation to the microbiome. So in summary, I hope I, I've shown you that microbiome studies can help us to advance detection of foodborne pathogens. At least they can help to uh, advance our understanding of, of uh, the ecology of foodborne pathogens. And I think the main advantages in microbiome research are made in sequencing approaches advances in sequencing by technologies and advantage, advances in bioinformatics. And what I want to mention last is that the public availability of those data sets, even old data sets in, in, in repositories like NCBI's SRA, make it possible to go back to some of those old data sets and retroactively um, apply some of those advantages especially the advantages in bioinformatics to all data sets. And I want to thank you for your attention.